Seeing how my first comparative review did better than any video I've ever made, I think we need another one. And seriously, is there a better way to start the day than with a little bit of Adam in your DNA? A man chooses. A slave obeys. Joke's on you, jackass. I choose to obey. So the Bioshock collection came out recently. Now, let me be honest, I... What the fuck? Who are you? What did you do to the girl? I am the girl, but I'm dressed up as a little sister for Halloween, like everyone else. God damn it, child. Take that off. Nope. Fine. I have to admit, since the collection came out, this comparative review will be for the entire series, meaning three score ratings. One for each game, excluding DLC. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I love the hell out of the Bioshock games. They are amazing. Probably the best non-open world first-person shooter story games out right now. With that in mind, I will try to avoid spoiling too much story stuff, even though the original Bioshock is 9 years old. Also, as a final note, the video is structured based on my original Steam reviews for the series, which you could probably find in the description below. Can you start already? God, why are you taking so long? Jeez, what's their problem today? But it's that costume, dressing up to look all weird and shit. Alright, no more distractions. So, as usual, the game needs to be split into different sections. Let's start with gameplay and customization. Being straight with you, Bioshock's gameplay is quite fantastic. The same basic formula is in all the games. You have a melee weapon, guns, and a drug or drinking problem. Not to say that they don't help, I mean, you gotta splice up if you wanna match a big daddy or start chugging to get toe-to-toe -to -toe with a handyman. Plus, the plasmid slash figures are pretty damn cool. Seriously, look at this. I use telekinesis to catch a grenade and throw it back like a hot potato. What about my awesome ability to freeze a bitch and shatter her with my drill? Or my hand of Neo. I'm Neo now. This is the exact same as that scene from The Matrix. Alright, maybe not, but still. But what is it that makes Bioshock's gameplay cool? Correct answer, the customization of your playthroughs. Even though you aren't playing an RPG, you still have an assortment of abilities and tonics that allow for different experiences each time. For example, if you want a big daddy as your bodyguard, you can have one. What about trying to make the entire environment under your influence? Absolutely. Airbending? No problem. And you can also upgrade all your weapons at Powder the People stations, should you find them all. What about Bioshock 2, Talal? Good question. You see, in Bioshock 1, you play as Jack, a man with a plan to be the strongest in the land or ocean, I guess. But in Bioshock 2, you play as Subject Delta, a badass Alpha Series Big Daddy who has a daughter he needs to protect. Now, as a Big Daddy, you are a pretty strong guy cladded in armor, so obviously you're more resistant to damage and a lot less of a pushover. To compensate for this, the developers made enemies cluster together more often and introduced new, bigger, and better enemies to challenge the player's wit and strategicness, such as the Brute Splicer and the Big Sister. However, this is Bioshock, and that means that they obviously aren't going to leave you out on some new mechanics. Hacking was completely overhauled because it was boring and time-consuming. And research wasn't exactly boring, but it was made so much more interesting as well. You're also given weapons similar to the previous game, but that suits your character's size and strength. The wrench was replaced with a drill, the machine gun was replaced with a minigun, so on and so forth. While this doesn't seem like much, it is a really important measure to take when changing the physique of the player character. A large and strong person should be using things that fit their size, not weapons too small for them to use efficiently or something that will slow them down without proper recompense. You are also able to dual wield a weapon and plasmid at the same time, which honestly I think is pretty cool. One final detail is that you can't fully upgrade all your weapons. This small change adds a new layer of depth to the series. How did it add depth to low? Very simple actually. 
The idea of limiting a player's choice of ultimate weaponry encourages careful decision making and preferences over just cycling between whichever weapon has the most ammunition at the time. Unlike in the first game, this one took a step towards choosing how you plan on playing the game early, and while not exactly the same, it does directly influence the gameplay of its sequel, Bioshock Infinite. Not gonna lie, while I did enjoy that game, I can't say I found it above and beyond the amazingness that is its predecessors. <clears throat> Bioshock Infinite's gameplay was a revamped version of Bioshock 2, with the addition of gears replacing gene tonics and vigors being reduced to a measly 8. Bioshock Infinite's weapon count is 14, too short of double the amount of weapons in each of the prequels, however, a lot of them are just reskins of other weapons that work a little bit differently. Also, while item cash and powder the people stations were how players got around to upgrading themselves, money means everything in Infinite. From buying ammo to vigors and weapon upgrades, the Silver Eagle is the universal currency and means of happiness in the game. A real utopia. But the main topic here is if the gameplay is good or bad, so let's get back to that. My main problem with the gameplay is that the weapons feel mediocre and the vigor uninspired. I strongly dislike Charge as is basically the drill dash from Bioshock 2. The bucking Bronco was cool at the start, but got stale later on. A lot of them have the exact same charge effect, which is, start quote, deploys the vigor as a stationary trap, end quote, followed by enemies being hurt after walking nearby. But it's not all bad. Why? Because of skyhooks. These little devices of death allow you to deliver brutal finishers as well as giving you the gift from God himself. Skylines. Skylines are the epitome of movement-based combat mechanics. It is a method of transportation as well as a form of dodging and attack. Also, it increases the pace of battle and really does give the term the sky's the limit a meaning. Finally, Bioshock Infinite brought the shield mechanic into play. Ever play Halo? Know the overshield? Same thing. It's basically a self-replenishing shield that goes up once the player isn't being damaged by enemy fire. Hacking and research. Have you ever had one of those puzzle games, you know, the ones where you have an assortment of pieces to solve the puzzles but are constantly running against the clock? Hacking in Bioshock 1 is basically that. Inspired by the 1989 puzzle game Pipe Mania, now referred to as Pipe Dream, the hacking in Bioshock is a puzzle minigame that has you connect two points of a board using a variety of tile pieces. But it's not that simple. You have four special tiles. One tile trips the alarm should your goo enter it, another one brings you down to one health, and two increase or decrease the speed of the goo as it passes. Actually, now that I think about it, it is pretty simple. But simple isn't the main problem. It's the repetitiveness that ruins the mechanic. It becomes a chore. A game should never make you bored when doing optional things, else it discourages you from wasting your time on it anyway. But what does it do exactly? Basically, it lets you open safes, reduces prices at vendors, and makes security systems friendly, which is really helpful if you're a pack rat or a cheapskate. Bioshock 2 took a different approach in hacking. The hacking system was redone to be quicker and less boring, using the needle on a panel kind of thing. First and most important, hacking is done in real time, so don't hack during combat, you don't want to die and that means losing the Big Brass Balls achievement. Also, you can hack at range thanks to the new hack tool, a cute little needle shooter that surprisingly doesn't harm enemies. Infinite scrapped hacking, the turret hacking was replaced with possession vigor, which is pretty boring. The section said research to low. what about that? Well, to put it bluntly, research is a means of increasing damage dealt to certain enemies as well as acquiring new abilities. How does that work? See, in Bioshock, you eventually find a camera that allows you to, uh, and I quote, analyze genetic information, parse biological structure. To do this, you need to take pictures of specific enemy types in a similar manner to Capcom's survival sandbox game, Dead Rising. The more, uh, intriguing the picture is, the higher the XP progress is. Bioshock 2 addressed this differently. Instead of taking photographs, you're now charged with videos for, uh, <laughs> research purposes. The basic idea is still the same. The more interesting the video is, the more XP given. But the research now requires some spice to it. The camera is hands-free, meaning you still have access to your weapons and plasmids. You're expected to cause a lot of suffering towards the enemy in a variety of ways if you want a good bonus. Between you and me, I personally think that this change in research was the best small mechanic the developer redid. It really makes it a fun process. What? What about Bioshock Infinite? They removed it entirely. Now let me tell you a story. 
Well, how do I put this? Everyone and their mother knows that Bioshock games have quite a strange story, and that they aren't afraid to mock ideals and religious zealotry. In Bioshock 1, you're put into the shoes of Jack, the sole survivor of a plane crash over an ocean. You happen to wake up, swim to an ambiguous lighthouse, and enter. You find a statue, and then climb onto this sphere thing? I don't know. The moment you hit the lever, it's quite like when Alice fell down the rabbit hole. You enter this entirely new world, a new concept never quite fully explored in a gaming before, an underwater city, Rapture. Right off the bat, you're introduced to Splicers and the mysterious man on the radio, Atlas, who serves as your guide. You learn to trust him, as he seems like a good family man who is helping you out in exchange for a chance to see his wife and kids again. Bioshock 2 expands on this fatherly ideal as well. But this time, you play as Subject Delta, one of the original Big Daddies. The game starts off with you taking care of your little sister, then killing the people who tried to hurt her, then killing yourself. Huh. Well then. You find yourself waking up somehow and begin the search for Eleanor, the little sister. What really makes this interesting though is how much the game alludes to the past. Many different moments and places in Rapture refer to the events in the previous game. A lot of audio recordings can be found from characters in the past and there's a clear indication that Delta went night-night before Jack's arrival and woke up after the events of Bioshock 1. Bioshock Infinite followed an inverse of Bioshock. You arrive there on a boat, enter a lighthouse, and then a pod. The pod doesn't send you downwards. Instead, it skyrockets you up beyond the clouds to the floating city of Columbia. In stark contrast to Rapture, the city heavily emphasizes on religion. Comstock ruled without a shadow of a doubt as the prophet, and you play as Booker DeWitt, a man with a debt he has to repay, being fully voiced and given character, a bit unlike the prequels. Overall, I think the Bioshock games have great stories, with the final one being the strongest tie-in and best at explaining everything that went down. I also heard that the DLCs were incredible, and that I should probably buy them eventually. Any additional points? Yeah, quite a few actually. Elizabeth is easily the best AI I've seen in a video game as a companion. She easily tops Skyrim's best follower, Sorana. She's got personality, awareness, and feelings, per se. Something that all followers in Skyrim don't have. And she's a hell of a lot stronger than she seems to be. Atmosphere is a factor in the games as well. In Bioshock 1, you first enter Rapture seeing it as this underwater metropolis, fully covered with neon lights, and the ads in the bathysphere really do emphasize how booming the city is. But the moment you leave the bathysphere and enter the city, you see the truth. The second game continues the theme of the City of Ash. It's all gone to hell and you've got no friends to help you. Bioshock Infinite, uh, constantly reminds you that you're in the sky. Uh, yeah. That's it. Ooh, ooh, and the Lotus twins are really cool too. Love them. I love the way they changed the little sister mechanic in Bioshock 1 to Bioshock 2. The whole defending her while she sucks blood from a corpse was genius. Soundtrack? Eh, it's alright. Ramsey here. Gonna interrupt this review comparison thing for a bit. I would like to comment on the navigation system in Bioshock 1, the arrow of confusion as I called it, because sometimes it was there spinning around not knowing what to do with its life, and other times it was just straight up gone, but besides that, that was the only gripe with this game I had. Ramsey out. Fair enough. I really gotta say, the Bioshock games are astonishing. They all get good scores because they are definitely worth it. Say what you will about the remasters being unoptimized, the original games are still included in the collection on Steam, so get it for that. Seriously man, there's no reason not to. What are the scores? Bioshock 1 gets a 9 out of 10, Bioshock 2 gets an 11 out of 10, because it was beyond perfect. Bioshock Infinite gets a 7.1 out of 10. Hello, thank you for checking out this video. Hopefully I convinced you to buy the Bioshock collection. It really is worth your time. But, I digress. Do you agree or disagree with what I said in the video? Know what I should do next? Let me know in the comments. By the way, shout out to my friend My Two Cents. I don't know if his first video will be out when I'm done with this one. He's kind of new to the YouTube thing and needs some guidance, so go check out his stuff in the description. Now, would you kindly subscribe and maybe share this with a friend? <laughs> Happy Halloween. Please let me explain. Bamir Vista Shane means you're grand. Bamir Vista Shane again, I'll explain. It means you're the fairest in the land. I could say Bella. Bella.
Uh, wait, wait, we're not done yet. Uh, bonus audio, I forgot to add in uh, when I was recording. Uh, hello, um, uh, I'd like to make a bit of an announcement. I'm not too sure when the next video is going to be coming out because as of right now, November is definitely a no-go and December is probably going to have all the additional exams or university applications. So maybe the next video will be out in 2017 or something like that. I'm not too sure. Uh, most likely than not, the video will either be about the Doom games or the Elder Scrolls. So, you know, good stuff. Also, follow me on my Twitter. Pretty cool. Well, I even said wonderbar. Each language only helps me tell you how grand you are. I've tried to explain.